All right, so this is a problem I, I mentioned at the beginning of class. Uh, this is one of the historical problems, right? This, in, uh, this is a geometric problem uh, that was uh, initially addressed by the Greeks. Uh, they were able to solve this problem for particular cases, but they were never able to solve this in a general sense. And so let's show the general solution to this problem and why it required the calculus for its solution. And in the process, we're going to develop the, the first important operator in calculus. We've talked about the limit. The limit is the foundation of all of calculus. But uh, the first operation in calculus that, that truly defines the topic is um, the derivative. And it turns out that the solution to the tangent problem is the derivative. Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, a tangent line to a curve is a uh, line that touches the curve at a point but doesn't cross it, literally cross it. Uh, so I put those terms in quotes because those aren't rigorous mathematical terms, right? In fact, uh, in order to solve this problem, we need something more rigorous. Uh, but that's the idea. So here's a picture of a function. Uh, the function here is uh, y equal x squared. And the point that I want to draw a tangent line to is this point here, 1, 1. So here's the graph, at least this side, right on the right in the, in the first quadrant. There's the graph of the parabola. Here's the point where I want to draw the tangent line. And there's the tangent line. Right? The tangent line touches the curve at just that one point. It's the only point of intersection between the curve and the line, but it doesn't actually cross it. It still stays on the same side of the curve. So there's the tangent line. Now, I know a point that the tangent line contains, but in order to find the equation, I still need more information. In particular, what I really need to know is what the slope of this line is. If I knew the slope, then, uh, in conjunction with the point, that would give me all that I need to uh, come up with the equation. But I don't have the slope. It's not indicated to me. Uh, I could measure it, I guess. You know, if I had a ruler or something, I could try and measure the slope. But that would be an estimation procedure, depending on how accurate my measurements were. It may or may not be close to the actual answer. How can we derive the slope of this line in a precise fashion, a rigorous fashion, and solve the problem of this line's equation. Um, okay, so here's how we're going to solve the problem. Uh, I don't have, I uh, only have a single point for the tangent line. What I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a secant line. I'm going to choose some other point on the graph. So I don't know, uh, maybe I'll choose this point here. There's a point. Okay. Uh, the x coordinate of this point, I'm not sure what it is right now, I'll just call it x. If the x coordinate is x, what's the y coordinate? Okay, what is y? Okay, what is f of x? There. What's the y coordinate? x squared. Every point on a graph is x, f of x. I told you what f of x was. That's the y-coordinate. Okay, so I've just arbitrarily picked this point on the graph. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct what's called a secant line. A secant line is a line that intersects a graph in two places. So my secant line, let me see if I can draw this. It's kind of hard to do. Uh, let me see if I can draw my secant line passing through this point. Okay, so there's a secant line. Um, now please notice that the secant line does not have the same slope as the tangent line that deviates. Uh, but I can, can't compute that. I can't compute the slope of the secant line. Uh, I'm going to call that m sec, m sub sec. How do I compute the slope of a line? Right, if I have two points, then the slope can be computed by taking the difference in the y-coordinates and then dividing that by the difference in the x-coordinates. So uh, the slope of the secant line, in this case, uh, the y-coordinates, x squared minus 1, over x minus 1. That would be the slope of any secant line that I choose for any given value of x. 
Okay, now what I'm going to do is the following. Starting from this point, I'm going to create a new sequence of, I'm going to create a sequence of secant lines by moving this point closer and closer to the point of tangency. So I'm going to do, I'm going to starting from this point, I'm going to move in, I'm going to move this line closer and closer to the point of tangency. What's going to happen to the secant lines as I do that? Well, here's a little picture. This, this is very hard to draw. I can't draw it. So I'm going to show you what happens as I start from a point. Uh, so uh, let me see. Let me get all this area. Yeah, so here's my point. In fact, this I'm starting here at the point 2. Here's the point of tangency right here, point 1. Here's my secant line. Right now, the slope of this line is equal to 2. Right? If I look at my formula here, uh, if I'm starting at the point 2, then this is what? 4 minus... No, that's my slope is 3, right? So if I start at x equals 2, the slope of that line is 3, right? Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, there it is. There's the slope of the secant line right there. Now, what happens as I start to move that point closer and closer to the point of tangency? Well, if you watch the secant line as I move this point closer and closer, what starts to happen? The secant line starts to orient itself more and more in the direction of the tangent line. Uh, right here, I'm at uh, one and a half. Uh, the slope has, uh, well, not quite uh, there. I'm at one and a half. Slope is 2.5. It's starting to become less steep becoming closer and closer to the actual slope of the tangent line. Uh, move down to about uh, one and a quarter. Now the slope is down to about 2.26. Getting closer. It's more and more orient itself in that direction. Uh, I'm going to get closer and closer. The closer I get to the actual tangent line, right now I'm about uh, what uh, a five-tenths of a unit away. Uh, and if I could actually collapse these lines on top of each other at the point zero, they would coincide. The problem is now the slope of the tangent line is undefined because I've forced that point to collapse onto one, so the tangent line no longer, or the secant line no longer has a definition. But it's clear what's happening. Starting from a point a, uh, that is a, a small distance away from, whoops, I lost everything. Where did my tangent line go? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, there. Okay, starting from a point small distance away from the tangent line, as I start to move that point closer and closer to the point of tangency, the secant line starts to orient itself in exactly the same direction as the tangent line. If I could actually complete the process, I would recover the tangent line in its entirety. But I can't literally do that because when the two points collapse, the denominator of that tangent line slope goes to zero and it's undefined. But I can see why that's going to work. The closer I get that second point to the point of tangency, the closer the slope of the secant line comes to the tangent line. And so, uh, it should be clear exactly what we need here. I need the limit process. What I'm doing is I'm applying the limit process to this expression. If I actually want to compute the slope of the tangent line, what I'm really doing is this. I'm taking the limit as x approaches 1. I'm starting from a short distance away and I'm moving closer and closer to the point where x is 1. That is the process through which the secant line's slope can be recovered. And now, uh, it turns out, and again, if I look at my diagram here, it turns out the actual slope of the tangent line uh, is, uh, oops, don't have this quite right. Yeah, the actual slope of the tangent line is 2. That's what the solution to this problem turns out to be. Uh, and again, uh, if I just look at, even if I didn't have uh, the graphic property, uh, if I look at this valuation here, like this valuation here, where I watch this, uh, this process of approaching the point, the closer I get to the point of tangency, the closer the value of the slope gets to 2. Which is exactly the sort of behavior we would expect if the limit was actually going to exist. And the uh, you know, same from the other side. If I start over here on this side, right now uh, the slope of the tangent line is is uh, smaller than the slope of uh, sorry the secant smaller than the tangent line slope, 
In the previous case, it was larger, but same principle, right? The closer I get to zero, the more and more the, tan the secant line orients itself in the direction of the tangent line. And the whole process breaks down at the point of tangency, but the limit can be established. Okay, so that's why we had to wait for the calculus to solve this problem, because the actual solution of the tangent problem is this uh, limit process being applied to this progression of secant lines. Okay, so uh, we can solve this problem by taking limits, and uh, we've already uh, seen a couple of ways that can be done. Uh, here's one way this can be done. Here's a table of values, very similar to uh, the table of values that we use to solve limits in the general sense. Now, this is a simple limit of a function now. Right? It's not the function that I'm applying the limit to. Right? The function I'm looking at in this case is the function x squared. Uh, the limit is being applied to the formula for the slope of the secant line. x squared minus 1 for the difference in the y-coordinates. x minus 1 for the difference in the x-coordinates. That's where that valuation is coming from. So when I actually plug this into the calculator uh, to observe what happens, so here's my sequence. I started at 1.5. At 1.5, the uh, value of the y-coordinate is 2.25. And here is that expression. That is the slope of the secant line. I moved to 1.25, got a little bit closer. That point, there's the value of the y-coordinate. Uh, I was able to compute the slope of the tangent line, 2.25. I moved within a tenth of a unit, 1.1, where the, tangent, where the uh, y coordinate is 1.21, the square. Uh, at that point, I was able to compute the slope as 2.1. And closing in even closer, 1.01, a hundredth of a unit, I get down to 2.01. If I observe the sequence of this progression, it becomes clear that the closer uh, the point gets to the point of tangency, the closer the value of the slope gets to 2. So from this observation here, I conclude that the limit as x approaches 1 of that formula for the secant line turns out to be about 2. That is the way I'm going to interpret the slope of the tangent line. Um, so, you know, this is a limit process. We already looked at the aspect of using tables to evaluate limits. Uh, but now um, it's not the function whose limit's being taken, but this arrangement of terms through the slope formula. But of course, we don't need to do that anymore. Uh, now, uh, there's some problems in the homework that ask you to do this, um, but for this example, uh, I don't need that. Let's go ahead and show. The slope of the tangent line is the limit process applied to this formula. Um, so, how do I, oh, first of all, what's the limit form of this? What's the limit form? Then determine it, right? If I do direct substitution, one for the numerator, one for the denominator. So, this is indeterminate. Okay, so uh, I can't draw any conclusion there, but once again, we already know what the trick here is. What's the trick? What's the trick? Factor, right? The numerator, difference of squares. And then the usual thing. Uh, the um, common factor cancels away. And under the assumption that x does not actually equal 1, which is implied by the limit, uh, this now can be solved through direct substitution. And there's the same result. Oh, not there. There. Two. Um, okay, so that's the, that was the missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, I was able to solve this problem by applying the limit. Now I've got the slope. Finally, I can come up with the equation. So uh, the equation of the tangent line is what? So what do I know about this line? It has a slope of 2, and it passes through the point 1, 1. 
So how do I find the equation of the line? Um, and I assume you guys all know how to do this. Right? We did this in pre-calculus. Um, let's see, how do I want to do it? I'm going to do it this way. If, you, if, you've, if you've been taught a different way, fine. You can do it that way. I'm going to use the slope-intercept form of the line. Right, every line has a form. Y equals mx plus b. What does m represent? Slope. What does b represent? Y-intercept. I know the slope in this case. Do I know the y-intercept? No. I have a point. Uh, this point is not the y-intercept, though. How do I know this point is not the y-intercept? Why? X equals 1. Yeah, x equals 1. What should it be if it's the intercept? Zero. zero. Okay. So I know that's not the y-intercept. Uh, so, uh, again, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. Um, I know the equation is going to end up looking like this. It's got to be y equals 2x plus b. I don't know what b is, but I can use this point here to find b. Because if the point 1, 1 really does fall on the graph, then that means I should be able to do the substitution. If I replace y with 2, uh, y with 1, and x with 1, then the equation only has one unknown remaining. Uh, and from here, I get b has to be negative 1. So the equation of the tangent line, y is equal to 2x minus 1. So the point of tangency, that was the first piece of information that I needed. Slope, I was able to obtain that through applying the limit. And there's the equation of the tangent line. And in the, once we had all this set up and understood what we were looking for, uh, this took a matter of seconds. Right? This uh, problem baffled the greatest minds of ancient Greek. But right, we first semester calculus students can now solve this problem in less than a minute. Okay, so that's what, that's, what, that's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for an algebraic system to support the limit process. Now that that's in place, we can do this for any function as long as we can solve that limit. Um, okay, so uh, let's rearrange things a little bit now. Uh, we've seen how this works itself out, um, but what we're going to do now is reformat this whole process and look at it in a more general sense. So uh, suppose I want to find the slope of a tangent line to a point uh, x equals a. So I've got a function f of x. I've got a point on the graph where I want to draw the tangent line. Uh, that point is a. Uh, how do I compute the tangent line itself? Okay, so here's the, this is a new arrangement now. We're going to relabel everything. It's going to be equivalent to what we started out with, but it's going to have a slightly different um, arrangement. Um, here's the point A right here. Right, there's the point A. Uh, here's where I want my tangent line to be. So this is the point A. What's the y-coordinate of this point going to be? All I know right now, this is, this is the function y equals f of x. That's all I know. I don't know specifically what f of x is. But if x is a, what is y? f of a. Right? That's all I can say. So this is the point a, f of a. Okay. Now I'm going to do, instead of choosing a second point B, say, what I'm going to do is instead of choosing that point directly, I'm going to choose it by measuring a distance from the point A. So I'm going to measure out a distance here, and I'm going to call this distance H. H is going to be how far away this second point is from the point A. So, if this is the point A, and this point is H units to the right of A, what would the location of this point be? A plus H. That's how I measure distance on the axis. However many units away from the prior point, I add that to it. Okay, that creates a second point on the graph. Uh, this point here now becomes the point A plus H. What does that make the y-coordinate? F of A plus H. Okay. 
And uh, now here's our construction. Right here's my secant line, the secant line running through the tangent point and this new point that I've located h units away from the point of tangency. So there's my secant line. There's my tangent line. Okay. And now the slope formula. Right. Uh, what is the formula that actually identifies the uh, slope of the tangent line? I'm sorry, the secant. Let's do the secant line. Well, it's the difference in the x, the, uh, the y coordinates go on top. So f of a plus h goes on top. I subtract f of a, the y coordinate of the second point, and then I take the difference in the x coordinates, the x coordinate of my point of uh, the secant point a plus h minus a, the x coordinate of the other point. And of course, what ends up happening is the A's cancel each other. And so that's where this formula comes from. And this is the formula that we're going to be using to express this relationship most frequently. In fact, uh, and so if this is the expression that defines the secant line, then the limit process as H goes to zero. So that's what's happening now. Instead of choosing the point directly and evaluating the point as it gets closer, I'm just going to let this distance H collapse to zero. So I'm bringing this point closer and closer to the point of tangency by letting h become smaller and smaller. So now, instead of the limit governing the variable directly, it governs that distance between uh, the point of tangency and the secant point. And so that generates the tangent line. This, the uh, limit process, letting h go to zero, applied to this new arrangement, is how the tangent line is defined, or the slope of the tangent line is defined. Uh, and again, we do have, there is a, you know, x is some particular, we have some particular point in mind, right? This isn't a general case. Uh, I assume that we have already decided where we want the tangent line to be located. So x is the value of the x coordinate of the point where we we're going to construct our tangent. Um, so this is the solution to the tangent problem. Uh, this piece here, this little piece uh, without the limit is called the difference quotient. Right. It's going to be a very important idea as we move forward. And uh, next week, not today I don't think, uh, but next week we're going to give this a name. Uh, we're going to call this a derivative process. The derivative, this is the first fundamental operator in calculus. The derivative is the solution to the tangent problem. We'll be look, we'll, in, next week we're going to extract this model from this geometric construction and look at it in a more general sense. Uh, but this is where it comes from. And when we start computing derivatives, we're always going to keep in the back of our minds where this came from. This came from the solution to the tangent problem. Okay, so uh, there we go. And by the way, right, here's the important point. Uh, you know, uh, we saw lots of instances in which the indeterminate form was the result of the limit process. In a lot of ways, those are very artificial. It's very difficult to look at a naturally occurring function in which the indeterminate form is the general result of the limit process. But... That is always the case in this operation. Uh, by the nature of this formulation, the, in the form of this limit will always be indeterminate. As h goes to zero, this first term becomes f of a, not subtracting f of a, so the numerator always goes to zero, h itself is going to zero. So here's a context in which the indeterminate form is the natural result. Again, as a general limit form doesn't occur very often in actual practice, but through the solution of the tangent problem, it is the only possible result. The indeterminate form is always the result of the process. Okay, so there we go. Right, We built up a brand new operation uh, by solving that old geometric problem. How do you find a tangent line when the only thing that you have to go by directly is the point? Um, okay, so let's do that. What's the equation of the tangent line to this graph? Um, well, first of all, let's go ahead and draw a picture. Right, let's go ahead and draw the picture. Um, what kind of graph is this? It's a line, okay. Um, how do I draw this line? How do I draw it? Where do I start? 
zero one, start the intercept. And how do I get to the next point? Yeah, so the slope is two. So, uh, so again, I'm referring back to that slope intercept form. Uh, two is the slope, and one is, or at least is the uh, y coordinate of the y intercept. So, uh, up two over one, uh, so there's my slope. So, the actual line itself, I guess, would look like this. There's a graph of this. Uh, the point 2, 5. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. Uh, I guess uh, here's the point where x is 2, so this must be the point 2, 5. And now this is kind of, now there's, a, there's an issue here. What is a tangent line to this point going to look like? We said earlier the tangent line was a line that touched the graph at a point but didn't actually pass through it. Only touch the graph at the one point. What's that going to look like in this case? I mean, is it even possible? It's the line itself. But that violates that other condition that the tangent point of tangency was the only point where the graph touched. Uh, and this is a, there's a philosophical issue here about what exactly the tangent line is. Uh, now, fortunately, when we gave our intuitive description here. Uh, we didn't actually require that that point be unique. Uh, but this was a real stumbling block for the Greeks because they understood that, that for a straight line there is no true tangent point in the sense that it only touches the line at one place. The line that we're talking about that satisfies the conditions of tangency would actually be the actual line itself. Um, but that's not an issue anymore because we can solve that problem directly by applying the limit process to this, to this particular example. Um, so let's do it. Let's actually apply the limit process and let's show that in order for our definition of the tangent to be consistent, that linear functions are their own tangent lines at every point. So in order to find the slope of the tangent line, I'm going to apply the formula. And again, just to remind you, the limit as h approaches zero, uh, and in this case, what is a equal to? Two, right? A is the x coordinate of the point of tangency. So in this case, a is equal to two. So according to the formula, two plus h minus f of two divided by h. Okay. So what is f of two plus h? Well, no, let's do the easy one first. What's f of 2? Yeah, we already knew that because they told us what the point was. But there, there's a verification. That 5, I didn't choose that out of thin air. That is the f of 2. Uh, what is f of 2 plus h? And here's our introduction to function composition. Again, I assume you've seen this before. Um, what does this tell me to do? How do I use the function to actually evaluate f of 2 plus h? I replace x with 2 plus h. Just like f of 2 tells me to replace x with 2. So in the formula for uh, the function, and please notice that the function was defined without using function notation, uh, but it's always implicit y and f of x name the same thing and in the formula we require function notation so even if your function isn't written in that way it's implied that f of x is an equivalent expression for uh, y. Uh, and now I'll go ahead and simplify this. I'll do a little distributing here. Uh, 2 times 2 plus h to doing the distribution Four plus two h plus one, and finally the four and the one combine there. So in the end, f of two plus h is five plus two h. Now I can plug that in. F of two plus h is five plus two h. There's that piece. F of 2 is 5. Five's cancel. And there it is. In fact, well, it already was indeterminate, but now it's even more clear. This is indeterminate. 
both parts of this go to zero. How does it simplify? No factoring is necessary. Sorry there. The H's cancel. So this is the limit of the constant, which is two. So the slope of the line is the slope of its tangent. If it passes through the same point, it must be the same line. So the tangent line itself is the line with the slope of 2 that passes through the point 2, 5. Well, that's the same line. Uh, so there it is. There's the establishment of the fact that every line is its own tangent line at every point. So a requirement of the tangent line can't be that it touched the graph in only one place. Here's an example of a tangent line that intersects this graph at every possible point. Um, the other issue is another one, uh, something like this. Uh, let me see uh, if I draw, yeah, draw a graph like that. Um, then, uh, for instance, the tangent line at this point. Right. Here's another example of a tangent line that actually intersects its curve in multiple places. It intersects it at the point of tangency and then it passes through the curve at another point somewhere along the way. Uh, this is another confusing issue. If you're requiring the tangent line only touch the graph at a single point, then this case here also violates that condition, not quite as in extreme sense as the line does, but that's a problem. But now uh, we see that that requirement that the tangent line be the unique point of intersection is not, not uh, necessary. And again, the line itself is an example, the most extreme case of the tangent line intersecting its graph multiple points. Okay, so that philosophical issue has worked itself out once we have a rigorous definition of what tangent line refers to. Um, okay, let's do that again. Let's do another, let me see how we're doing here. Um, yeah, let's do this one. Let's go ahead and do this one. Uh, what's the slope of the tangent, or what's the, uh, well, well, we're going to do two things. We're going to find the slope, then we're going to use that to find the equation, and then we're going to draw a picture. We're going to draw the picture of the whole thing. Okay, so uh, th in this case, we're not told directly what the point is. We're just told what x is equal to at the point. That's all we need. The equation of the line only requires that we identify the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. Uh, so uh, our equation here, same one. I've chosen my point of tangency. Let's see if we can determine the slope of the tangent line now. So uh, what's this going to be? The limit. Uh, so again, m tan. The limit as x approach, uh, h approaches 0. There's no x in this anymore. f of a plus h, what is a in this case? One, we were told that. Minus f of a all divided by h. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, uh, so once again, um, let's put these components in place before we get down into it. Uh, f of one, I'm going to need that. Uh, what is f of one equal to? Three. And what is f of one plus h? What is that equal to? Okay, so there is the, what's intended. So uh, I'm going to have to work all, I'm going to have to expand that out, get everything, all like terms together wherever possible, see if I can simplify this. So let's see, what do we get when we work all of this out? Uh, 4 plus 4h minus the square of 1 plus h. What's the square of 1 plus h? Okay, I'm going to do it the other direction. All right, there's the square of 1 plus h. Um, that's a FOIL problem. Don't forget, squaring the binomial, that's a FOIL problem. 1 plus h times itself. And now the, quant the square quantity is being subtracted, so there's still a distribution that has to be completed. Uh, 4 plus 4h 
minus 1 minus 2h minus h squared. So there is the, um, all the parentheses have been eliminated, all the distributions, the foiling, all of that's been taken care of. And finally, I've got a couple of places where I can uh, combine like terms. So these two terms are like, they can be combined, and these two terms here, they're like. So in the end, uh, what does this end up being? Um, 3 plus 2h minus h squared. Is that right? Um, okay, so there's all of, uh, there's the two components to that numerator. Uh, I worked all those out in advance. Uh, so now we can actually apply the formula. We're taking the limit as h goes to zero of the quantity 3 plus 2h minus h squared. And then we're going to subtract 3 from that. So here's the f of 1 plus h. And here's the f of 1 and all of that over zero. And of course, and this is always going to happen whenever you're applying this definition directly, uh, what I see, the constant terms cancel away, and all I have remaining are terms that all involve factors of h. So at this point, got the limit as h approaches zero of what, 2h, minus h squared over h. And, uh, you know, as usual, this turns out to be indeterminate, but once again, the simplification here is pretty straightforward. All terms involve that denominator as a factor, so all that cancellation takes care of itself. This h here cancels one factor of h here, one factor of h here. And so what do I have left? 2 minus h. So what's the slope of the tangent line? 2. At this point, I can do the direct substitution, and there's my tangent. Okay, so there we go. Uh, I've got the slope of that line now, like so. Um, okay... How are we doing? Yeah. Now let's go ahead and finish this. Uh, next step, what is the equation of the tangent line? Is that what we have here? Yeah. So I've got the slope being 2 and I've got the point 1, 3. So just like before, I'm going to go ahead and do this straight through the slope-intercept form. I know that the line has to have this form. Uh, I don't know what B is, but I do have valuations for uh, X and Y. So if I let Y be 3, and if I let X be 1, then I can solve for B. So uh, B has to be 1. Oh man, it's the same line. It's weird. So the tangent line is the same one we got in the previous case. Hmm, didn't mean for that to happen. Well, 2x plus 1. Okay, let's draw the picture. What does this look like? Well, let's start with the graph. Uh, the function uh, y equals 4x minus uh, x squared. What kind of graph is that? Parabola? Opens down? Uh, what are the intercepts? Yeah, okay, let's do it this way. What are the intercepts of that graph? Where does this graph have um, uh, its two x intercepts? So I'm starting from here, I'm starting from this graph. Now let's put it in function notation. Okay, so I'm starting from here. So square power tells me this is a parabola. The square uh, coefficient of the square being negative tells me it opens down. Um, what are the zeros of this function? If I set this equal to zero, uh, where do I locate the intercepts? 
factor. Okay, how does this factor? So what are the two intercepts? Four and zero. So one intercept would be here, one intercept would be here, right here in the middle. Because of the symmetry of the parabola, this graph uh, must have its vertex right in between these two. Uh, so it must look something like this. Something like that. Uh, I don't know. I didn't, didn't really preserve the symmetry here. Okay, something like that. And now what about the tangent line? Uh, we've already drawn it, so it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, I've got the, uh, uh, and again, trying to get all this to scale. The tangent line should look like this. That should be my tangent line there, if this is the actual graph. Uh, here's the point where x is 1. That must be the point 1, 3. And the slope of this line must be 2. So uh, obviously not to scale, but uh, run 2, uh, rise 2, run 1. So that must be what this diagram looks like. Uh, there's a graph of the parabola, there's my tangent line, y equals 2x plus 1, and there's the parabola, y equals 4x minus x squared. Did all that from, from scratch. Um, let's try one more of these. Try this one. Uh, I don't really want a picture. In fact, the only thing I want here is a slope. I don't even want the equation this time. All I want you to do is tell me uh, what's the slope of the tangent line uh, to this curve at this point. The rest of it, we can always fill in the details. Okay, so uh, again, uh, I know, so there's uh, the, the point where I want my tangent line to be, so that tells me what I want A to be. So I know I'm going to need F of 2. F of 2 is equal to what? 1 half. I'm also going to need F of 2 plus H. What is F of 2 plus H going to be equal to? 1 over 2 plus H. Okay. So that's it. Now if I want to compute the slope of the tangent line, I'll do it like this. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat the, the uh, um, definition. I want you to know this. So f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 all over h. And in this case, the substitution gives me the following. Uh, 1 over 2 plus h in front. 1 half and back, subtracting all over h. So that's what happens when I plug in uh, the subs or do the substitutions in the appropriate way. It's indeterminate. If I replace h with 0, I get 0 in both locations. But here's an example. At least as written right now, there's no, really, no, no factorization. Right? At this point, I'm really kind of stuck because uh, I don't have any cancellation that I can see directly. Uh, so how do I fix this? What's the trick dealing with, uh, and of course this is the case of compound fraction. I've got a fraction that has fractional components within its own parts. How do I fix this? I identify the least common denominator for all the fractions that are involved. In this case, the two fractions, 2, 2 plus h, the denominators, that pro they have no factors in common, so the least common denominator is going to be that product. So in order to move forward, I'm going to have to use that trick, and I think we talked about that last week, I'm going to use that trick of um, using the least common denominator to multiply both parts of the fraction. So in the numerator, I'll multiply 2 times 2 plus h, and the denominator, I'll multiply 2 times 2 plus h. Okay, so if I've done this correctly, when I'm finished, I should have a simple fraction. All fractions within the fraction itself should have been cleared away. 
it should be clear what happens in the denominator. No, uh, it really, and please make sure that you do the same thing in both parts. Once you decided how you're going to clear the fractions from the numerator, you've got to use that same multiplier in the denominator or else you're going to change the value of the fraction. In the denominator, I'm just going to get h multiplied by the common denominator. Okay. What happens in the numerator? Uh, when I multiply this product by the reciprocal of 2 plus h, what do I end up with? 2, right? The 2 plus h cancels, and all I have left is the factor of 2. From that, I'm going to subtract the product of 1 half with that denominator, or LCD. What will the result of that be? 2 plus h. So over here, the uh, 2 plus h cancels. I end up with 2. Here, the 2 cancels. I end up with 2 plus h. And make sure you put that in parentheses. It's that quantity that's being subtracted. Uh, and now, again, now I can see why that is going to be helpful because now that constant term is going to cancel away. What, I, what remains in the numerator? Negative h, so that eight, that negative from the subtraction still remains. And downstairs in the denominator, I've still got uh, that product sitting, waiting to see what happens. What happens? That common zero factor cancels away. What's left in the numerator? Negative one in the denominator. And finally, now I can finish this. The zero can go in place of the H. This is no longer indeterminate. So what's the slope going to end up being? Negative one fourth. So here's another we did we did we worked an example like this last week using the uh, LCD to clear a compound fraction, and uh, in the process of solving the uh, limit problem here, uh, clearing those fractions allowed us to uh, produce the zero factor that we needed to cancel away. And now, if I needed to find the actual equation of this line, now I've got all the information I need. I've got a slope got a point that can be completed now. Um, okay, uh, so there's that. Uh, let me mention one more thing real quick. 